Today from the Global Lane, COVID-19 strikes the Middle East. Author Joel Rosenberg on the threat to Israel. On the home front, the economic impact on the stock market and 401ks. Time to get out? Don't touch it. It's a temporary event. Deep Throat's lawyer on the origins of the Foreign Intelligence Security Act. Watergate, lies from the FBI and the American media. Looking for help during the COVID-19 crisis? Max Licato on faith over fear. And it's all right here on The Global Lane. With the worst of the COVID-19 viral outbreak, perhaps over for China, many other countries are struggling to contain the virus and save lives. From the Western Wall in Jerusalem to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Chris Mitchell tells us how the coronavirus is changing the Middle East. In Mecca, the black stone sits alone. Saudi Arabia decided to block access to Islam's holiest site as part of its fight to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Egypt has reported hundreds of cases that severely hit its tourism industry. Jordan's King Abdullah presided over a COVID-19 meeting and implemented a compulsory quarantine for all those entering the country. Iran has been the hardest hit in the region, with more than 850 deaths, some among its leadership. Everyone must help. We're in circumstances that in order to get through it as quickly as possible, we require collective assistance. Iran is a major hotspot, and there are thousands of people there that are infected, and the estimates are that there could be tens of thousands. Seth Fransman maintains a daily news digest on MiddleEastCenter.org that monitors the impact of the coronavirus in the Middle East. These are countries that have a huge role in the global economy. They knit together this kind of globalized world we live in. And all of those economies are gonna suffer massively from this. And I think we need to understand that the reverberations will go on for years. The refugees in the region are at greatest risk. Many of them do not have access to basic uh, healthcare needs. And that means also that they are prevented usually from what we would think of as tests. For instance, in Europe and America, it's difficult sometimes to get a test for this virus. Imagine if you're in a camp or you're near Raqqa or Kamishle in Eastern Syria, your chances are zero. This pandemic could have a massive ripple effect in the region and set back not only Gulf economies, but also all these economies that are affected around it. Author Joel Rosenberg joins us for more. He has spent much time in the Middle East. He's written a new novel, a Middle East thriller, The Jerusalem Assassin. I had a chance to read the book. I, I liked so it very Thank much. You. I want to talk to you about that in, in a little bit here. But first, coronavirus. How do you think, Joel, this is going to flush out and affect the Middle East in the long term? Well, at the moment, it's got the entire Middle East paralyzed. Uh, Israel is on a complete lockdown. It feels strange for me with my wife and three sons uh, living in Jerusalem. Uh, they are in complete lockdown. You can't go anywhere. There's no movie theaters open, only supermarkets, uh, pharmacies and gas stations, although you're not really supposed to go anywhere. So I don't know why people need to drive. That's extraordinary. Uh, every tourist and business person has been asked to leave the country. Nobody's being allowed into the country. Even the worst of our wars and suicide bombers, uh, we've never shut the country down. And, and, and this is happening throughout the region. At least with the missiles from Gaza, you can see those rockets coming in. That's right. Right? This, this is an invisible uh, enemy. And you know what's interesting for Israel? Uh, Netanyahu and the government, uh, they need a, we need a full government. That's a separate issue. But... Netanyahu is absolutely doing the right thing because Israel is a small country. We skew uh, older. We've got a Holocaust uh, survivor population that's older. So we've got to protect our country. But there's another issue. If Israelis start getting sick en masse, countries all over the world will ban Israelis from ever entering their country. Uh, and that would be worse than the political effects of BDS, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. So we've got to nip this thing in the bud, uh, both for our health and for our commercial and, you know, other uh, interests uh, worldwide. Now, Bibi's handling of this, how do you think that may affect uh, Benny Gantz and his efforts to uh, form a government? Well, Gantz has pulled, has extraordinarily pulled all the opposition to Netanyahu together. They have 62 seats. Netanyahu, even though his party did better than ever, they only have 58 seats with the, their coalition. So at the moment, Gantz has the first shot to put the government together. But I think what we need is a national unity government. I don't think the electorate in any of these last three elections has given Netanyahu uh, a full majority or Gantz. So these guys, as much as they don't like each other, 
in a crisis, they need to come together and form a, a, a national unity government. Now, on your book, uh, The Jerusalem Assassin. Yeah, let's, keep, let's hope that stays fiction. Because we've got enough troubles in <laughs> well, our part I, of the world. I was going to ask you about that because it, it seems like, okay, you, you've got a U.S. president, you've got an Israeli prime minister, you've got the king of Saudi Arabia right. all coming to Jerusalem while an assassin is running loose. That's right. It's quite a thriller. Or more than one. Uh, more than <laughs> one, yes. That's right. Basically, uh, the Jerusalem assassin is a political thriller about an American president getting ready to roll out his big Israeli-Palestinian peace plan when a series of senior U.S. officials who were involved in drafting the plan start getting assassinated. So the president gets rattled, thinks maybe I shouldn't release it. But right at that moment, he gets a back-channel message from the Saudis saying, Mr. President, we're not a big fan of all the details of your plan, but we're ready to make peace with Israel. If you will invite us to a high-profile summit, a peace summit in Jerusalem with the Israeli prime minister, and you host us, Mr. President, the Saudi leader will come. And the president is excited about that. But his security advisors think that's insane. <laughs> Don't do that. Not now. And Marcus Riker, the hero of the story, Marine, former Secret Service, now CIA, he's tasked with making this summit safe unless all hell breaks loose. And you're quick to mention in your notes, uh, look, even though, you know, I've, I've traveled around in the Middle East, I've met with uh, the Saudi leadership and so forth. Right. There's nothing in here that is actually quoted from dialogue that I've right. had. Right. Uh, but it seems like this is uh, taken from the news. Well, look, I believe that the Iran threat, uh, the Iran nuclear threat, the Iran terror threat is so existential, uh, not just to Israel, but to all the Arab countries in the region, that these Arab leaders, that you're right, I have sat and spent hours and hours and hours with the, all the top leadership in Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, and there's others in the region too, Oman, Morocco. They all are actively considering maybe Israel's actually an ally and a friend, not the enemy we've always portrayed them as. And this is causing them to consider, is it time? Uh, Marcus Riker, Devout Christian, yeah. committed believer, yeah. uh, but also he's a, a tough guy. He's really, when things get tough, he, he really knows how to jump into action. Is that a little bit like Joel Rosenberg? Uh, no, he's far more uh, brave <laughs> and far more uh, skilled. I just make things up for a living, Gary. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, sharing about your book. My pleasure. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep as the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the events shaping the world. What starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 9.30 on the CBN News Channel. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. Trump wants Congress to approve his $1 trillion coronavirus stimulus plan to support hard-hit businesses and send checks to Americans. The plan includes a $500 billion payroll tax cut, 
50 billion for the airline industry and 250 billion for small business loans. With this invisible enemy, we don't want airlines going out of business. We don't want people losing their jobs or not having money to live when they were doing very well just four weeks ago. So we're going big. Joining us to provide some COVID-19 economic fallout information is national radio and TV host of Financial Issues, Dan Celia. Okay, Dan, the president's stimulus plan, good idea, bad? Will it make a big difference here if Congress acts quickly? Uh, it's not going to make a big difference uh, no matter how quickly they act. I mean, obviously, we want them to get it done and get it behind us, but obviously it's going to have to trickle through, so it's going to take a little bit of time before that happens. But at the rate we're going, I've never seen anything like this. This president is getting things done so quickly. It is absolutely amazing that we have a government that has been so flexible in the way they work with so many different agencies and the private sector at the same time to get things done. It is something that we will likely never see again. It's pretty amazing. And Dan, I've seen comments from people on social media saying things like, no, please, Mr. President, don't mortgage our children and grandchildren's future with just a thousand dollar check and possibly more later in the year. So Dan, short term gain, long term pain here. The pain has been there for some time. I don't think this is going to make a whole lot of difference uh, on any kind of long term pain. I don't think there's going to be long term pain. We've got twenty one trillion dollars worth of debt. Uh, this is going to add another trillion. The pain has been there with or without that. I'm not saying that we should be adding a little bit more on top of it. This is going to be handled on a different balance sheet. It's probably, a lot of this isn't going to show up on our overall um, uh, government debt that we see, you know, with that, that debt clock ticking away because of the emergency kind of spending that it is. But nonetheless, it has to be done. It has to be done. Instead of sitting around waiting for a government check, what should people do with their 401ks, other investments during such a volatile market and record declines? Don't touch it. That's the best thing they could do. I know that is counterintuitive from our human nature. But look, this is going to pass. It's a temporary event. It may not pass as quickly as we'd like. It may be, you know, September, October, maybe early next year. But nonetheless, if you're in it for the long term, then you're okay. It's going to be great because the recovery isn't going to be quite as quick as the downturn, but it is coming in short order. And it's not something we should be concerned about. Gary, what everybody does is they react to news. They sell on bad news. They buy on good news. A lot of bad news right now. That means you're selling low and you're going to wait and buy back high. It's not a good thing. Stay put. It's the best thing they could do. Okay, good advice from Dan Celia. As always, my friend, thank you for your timely insights. You're welcome, Gary. I appreciate it. God bless. On October 1st, 1961, history was made when a tiny station began transmitting the first signals of the Christian Broadcasting Network. CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. And now, a new era has begun with the all-new CBN News Channel. Just moments ago, the Iron Dome intercepted an incoming rocket right on the Gaza border. And ministering in this area, spiritual warfare is definitely involved. A 24-7 news network, bringing you the news you want from a source you can trust. In Kenya, 40% of the medical services are actually provided by these Christian hospitals. Let's talk about the economy. Believers here are joining together to win people to Jesus Christ. All your favorite shows now in one place. Go to CBNNewsChannel.com to find out how to get the CBN News Channel on your TV all day, every day. CBN News. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep today. Life, 
It's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life, live it fully. CBN.com. The U.S. Senate has approved a 77-day extension of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, also known as FISA. The FISA law will remain in place until they draft more permanent legislation that would curb the government's monitoring capabilities. Fraudulent FISA warrants were used to spy on the 2016 Trump campaign. The president suggested he'd veto FISA legislation until, quote, we find out what led to and happened with the illegal attempted coup of the duly elected president of the United States and others. Well, here to set us straight on this is former assistant U.S. attorney for Northern California, John O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor is known as Deep Throat's lawyer, and he represented Mark Felt after the Watergate scandal. He's written the book Postgate, How the Washington Post Betrayed Deep Throat, Covered Up Watergate, and Began Today's Partisan Advocacy Journalism. Why was the FISA law abused? What do you think? Why did the FBI lie to the FISA court to obtain permission to spy on campaign staffer Carter Page during the 2016 Trump campaign? Well, it actually goes back to my client. Most people don't realize this. Mark Felt, my client, who was deep throat, who was known so much for helping Bob Woodward by going into the garage, which he did to uh, caused publicity to keep the Watergate investigation open. At the very same time he was doing that, he was trying to protect our country from the PLO, uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine Liberation Organization, which had just slaughtered uh, Israeli athletes in Munich. They had come to New York to slaughter citizens, mostly Jewish. The Weather Underground had bombed 50 government buildings and uh, was going after all government installations. He authorized what at the time was what the government had always done, the FBI had always done informally before FISA, and he did some warrantless entries of those people. So the Washington Post, who he had made into a billion dollar organization, the Washington Post uh, railed for the indictment of Mark Felt and railed for his conviction. Well, Ronald Reagan pardoned him as soon as he got in office. And FISA is nothing more than a legislative court which says, mother may I, uh, you can go ahead to the people like the FBI so that they can have the certainty that they won't be Mark Felton, so that they won't be convicted by a kangaroo court. That was their um, remedy. FISA set up a bunch of people in black robes who sit there, they're well-meaning, intelligent, savvy people, but the FBI can fool them. Anytime it wants, it can come in and say, the sky is falling, uh, you know, Agent Stroke and Agent This and Christopher Steele are all just wonderful people, and they say that uh, there's a danger to our uh, country, give us a warrant. Now what happens is, because of FISA, those agents are covered, they're blanketed. Now look right now at Comey and, uh, McCabe and all these people talking about how, oh, boy, this FISA process is complicated. We didn't know what these underlings were doing. Essentially, there may not be any accountability for this. So President Trump is absolutely right. The most important uh, way to uh, hold these people accountable is to investigate and, if necessary, prosecute, if necessary, take some jobs. Seems journalism today has gone way beyond solid investigative journalism. What happened? Well, you can draw a straight line from the biased and untruthful, dishonest, fraudulent, and I will use those words advisedly, journalism of Watergate, draw a straight line to Russiagate and Ukraine gate. The only difference is in, in, in Watergate, it took a year before the Post reporting took hold and was amplified by the electronic media. Today, it's instantaneous. Today, President uh, Trump gets off a phone call and uh, like Colonel Vindman immediately whispers to his buddy and uh, Schiff 
and we're off to the races. And it's aided and abetted, incited by the press. None of this could go on unless you had a dishonest press. Under the Constitution, the press is supposed to be, if you read the Federalist Papers, uh, supposed to be an antidote to factionalism, which is what has happened in recent years. Gross factionalism, because the press is supposed to be free and unfettered and, and would give opposite sides, all sides, all facts, so that factionalism would be reduced or remedied. But what do we have now? We now have a monolithic press that itself is a factional uh, institution, so to speak. And it was given its credentials by Watergate. Watergate said that the media is a fourth branch of government, in essence. It's the Magna Carta for media people. And the media is unaccountable to anyone else. The other three branches of government all have checks and balances. The media doesn't. How do you hold the media accountable? And I, I, okay. I, I think we just have to do something about it. The book is Postgate, How the Washington Post Betrayed Deep Throat, Covered Up Watergate, and began today's partisan advocacy journalism. John O'Connor, thank you for setting us straight today. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep today. I'm Ephraim Graham, and this is Studio 5. Cruise with me as I discover the good things happening in the world of music, sports, television, and movies. The fact that Ryan Coogler was going to be directing the film, I knew that something special was going to happen. We'll chat with artists at the forefront of entertainment and explore the connection between popular culture and faith. I asked my pastor, I said, well, does that mean I'm supposed to be a preacher? He says, well, no, you already have a pulpit. Watch Studio 5, Wednesday night at 9.30. Remember for a moment what it was like to be a child. You believed every story you were told. You saw a world full of endless possibilities. What stories will the world's orphaned and at-risk children believe? We believe the Bible tells the only story truly worth believing. We believe that every child should have the opportunity to dream, the chance to take challenges and turn them into possibilities, the chance to stand on the promises of God, to recognize their place in the greatest story ever told. They have their whole lives ahead of them. Theirs is a world of endless possibilities. They are looking for a story to believe. We will tell them that story. Will you join us? In the midst of a viral pandemic, who do you turn to for help? The President of the United States? Donald Trump may sit in the Oval Office, but last time I checked, God still sits on the throne. God is our protector, defender, and healer. Oak Hills Church Pastor Max Licato is author of the book, Anxious About Nothing. He says at a time like this, we need to feed our faith instead of our fears. You know, if you feed your faith, your fears will starve. But if you feed your fears, your faith will. So we have to make a intentional decision during this season of high anxiety and turbulence to encourage one another, to encourage one another, and to feed one another's faith. And also we need to take the initiative to feed our own faith. So I encourage you, my friend, I encourage you, don't give in to despair, don't give in to anxiety. We're going to get through this. We really are. Our Heavenly Father is still on the throne. I love what Chuck Swindoll always says, that God is not sometimes sovereign. He's always sovereign. He really is, folks. He really is. And we're going to get through this. It may not be quick. It may not be easy. But God is going to use this for good. And the, the, the challenge that awaits us is, is to not give in to despair, not do foolish things, but to trust, to trust, to be that voice of trust. 
I continue to say that the key question that we all need to be asking right now is what is God saying to us? What is God saying to us? I think He's talking to the whole world. I do. I think He's talking to the whole world. I think He's telling us that our priorities have been misplaced, and that we have made idols out of entertainment and, and savings accounts. I think He's calling us back to Himself. I do. I do. Is this a signal of end times, as some people are saying? I do not know. I do not know. But I do know that God is doing something in the world, and He's calling upon us. He's talking to the whole world. And then number two, I think He's testing the church. By that I mean He is strengthening us. He's calling upon us to be the people He desires for His church to be. You'll remember that when Jesus fed that crowd of 5,000 men plus women of children, uh, the gospel tells us that Jesus tested his, tested his followers by telling them to feed those people. He tested them. He tested them. And what they, what they did not do was pass that test. If they had, they had passed that test, they would have said, Lord, you need to do this. We cannot. But what they did is they looked into their own resources and they counted their money and they looked into the basket and all they had was a few bread and few fish and they said, Lord, we cannot do this. They did not pass the test because they did not come to Him. They, they could have and they should have looked to Him and said, Lord, you can do this. And so that's, that's the call of the church right now is to be the people who come to God and say, God, we cannot solve this, but you can. Bless our leaders. Bless those in research. Bless those who are vulnerable. Psalm 91, Lord God, we who dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And we will say of you that you are our refuge. You are our fortress. You are our God. And in you we will trust. You will deliver us from the snare of the fowler. You will deliver us from the perilous pestilence. You will cover us with your feathers. Under your wings we shall take refuge. Your truth, your truth shall be our shield and our buckler. And we will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. Look at this. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. And skipping over to verse 9. We have made you and are seeking to make you, Almighty God, our refuge, the Most High, our dwelling place. For we know that in that place no evil shall befall us, nor shall any plague come near our dwelling. This is a time for faith. This is a time for trust. This is a time for hope. And that's it today from the Global Lane. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Twitter. Remain calm during this global viral pandemic. And remember, God is still on the throne. This too shall pass. And keep praying. And until next time, be blessed.